Man is a great woman, and Laura, we're so thankful for you and 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 uh, all of your family, each one of your children, um, uh, because that's a huge backbone of the church as well. So we appreciate your ministry to us and your kindness and your gardening this summer. And Lance and I have not been going to this church even very long, and we acknowledge, you know, what uh, what servants you are to this church. So I'm still there. I'm sure there's still so much more we have to see and learn to be thankful for from you guys. Um, all the behind scene things that you do that we don't see or don't know. We just thank you so much for all those things. Um, and we just hope you feel loved and appreciated for however many years that you stay here or don't stay here. Um, we appreciate your work, and we're so thankful that um, we have somewhere to go where the Bible is preached, and we do not have to concern ourselves with the truth that's being spoken. Um, it's just so wonderful to have the, those challenges every day that are real. We don't just come here to sit in our chairs and feel good about ourselves, but that we're really being challenged to grow. And um, for myself as well, being a, a new here, being uh, able to have those opportunities to serve and challenge myself in that way. Thank you so much for giving me that opportunity to teach Sunday school class and um, help in other ways. But I really feel like this is a great place for me to grow and learn. And so I also hope for the members who are new here or who are old here that you guys are continued to um, continuing to challenge yourselves and take up Pastor Vlad's word and what he says and Laura's example and her children's example as well. So thank you so much for your service to us. Um, yeah, and I hope you guys continue. We still have one more week in October, but like Mike said, um, pastor appreciation can be all year round. So thanks. Again, good morning. Um, yeah, um, yes, we appreciate you, Pastor Blad and the family. And um, yeah, welcome to Nepal First Baptist Church to today's um, church service. It's just so wonderful and so glad. And it's a blessing to see so many smiling faces because we know that it's the um, month of October is Pastor's Appreciation Month. And also I wanted to um, remember that this month we have like birthday celebrators like we know that there's plets help me out Pat, tita gilbert i know it's october 20 20 and tita peter is also october 20 21 and who else before we'll, we'll sing happy birthday like can we all like sing a happy birthday song to all um to our bo um two dearly beloved elders in the church can we all like sing together happy birthday to you happy birthday to you happy birthday happy birthday happy birthday to you say happy birthday to peter happy birthday to gilbert and if this is your and who else tita Oh yeah, the twin. Tito John, happy birthday to <laughs> Yeah, like the twin. Happy birthday Tito Peter, Tito John and Tito Gilbert. Oh yeah, hundred second birthday of Alan Newton. Happy birthday, Mr. Newton. And um, yeah, if this is your first time in this church, um, we want to extend our special um, warm welcome to all of you for coming and worshiping with us. So it's great to have you all us, um, with us. So allow me to read Psalms chapter 140, Psalms 42, verses one up to three. So as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, so where is your God? Um, so please stand as you are comfortable as we sing our first song, and I'm calling my family here to 
help me out. So my husband Demi is coming, my daughter Veronica is going to play the piano, and I have my nephew Marcelino and my nephew-in-law Marl and my daughter Jemima to help me out. So our first song is As the Deer. So uh, if you are comfortable, so please stand and let's worship the Lord this morning through singing this song. Thank you. 
Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are just grateful. We are just so thankful, Father, that we have the freedom to praise you, to glorify your name, to worship you, to magnify your name. Father, you deserve all this glory. You deserve all this honor. We are just so thankful, Father, that you love us. Thank you, Father, for that love, for that mercy. Thank you, Father, that we could utter our praises to you, that we could sing songs of glory to you, Lord God. Father, we wanted to pray, Father, that you will continue to lead us. Your Holy Spirit will lead us, Father, as we continue to worship you, as we continue to glorify your name. And please be seated. Our next song is We Fall Down. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. And what we can do is always just give all this glory. And we cry, holy, holy, we cry, holy, holy to the Lamb who was slain. And that is our Jesus Christ. Our next song is We, cry, we Fall Down. Oh, no. <laughs> You could also sing with us, and if you are comfortable to stand, please do so. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus, the greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus, and we Father in heaven. I'll be reading Psalms chapter 13. From the New International Version. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God, give light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. I read Psalm chapter 13, verses 1 to 6. And I would like to invite Pastor Fred to help us with the prayer time. Okay. Time.
time for prayer. Uh, doesn't the scripture says that his house shall be called a house of prayer? So let's just bow our heads together as we just talk to the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we come and say, Hallowed be thy name. We thank you, Lord, for the marvelous grace, mercy, and love that we sense and feel hour by hour, day by day. Thank you, Father. We thank you for the outreach of the gospel in our wonderful land, in our town, our community. And right now, Lord, as we gather here for this time of worship and the preaching of your word, we pray for others that are in our uh, town that are also gathering to lift up the name of Jesus, proclaim the word of God. And Lord, we pray that as a result that the coming week will be a week of victory in many lives. Touch hearts that are discouraged and down, downcast. Touch bodies that need your healing touch. Those in our midst, Lord, that, that need your healing touch today. We thank you, Father, that we can just look to you and trust you for the days ahead for our town, our community, and our troubled world. We thank you for your word, Lord, which gives us the reason why we're here. And we just pray that your word would be a blessing to us today. Bless Pastor Vlad as he unfolds your word in the in this uh, book of Genesis to us, Lord, to uh, strengthen, encourage, and challenge us, Lord, to be light and salt each day. We give you praise and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Now that we have Pastor Fred, we'll be calling um, Pastor Fred's other half, Sylvia, and they'll be doing a special ministry for us. There are over 200 words, uh, titles given to, given to Jesus in the Bible. Cruden's Concordance says there are 600 titles and references to Jesus in the Bible. I know you know many of them. But among the many that there are, for me, for us, I think the one that stands out above them all is one that we know very, very much. Simply, I am. And we'd like to sing that, if we can. Okay. I am the Lord, I am Almighty God. I am the one whom nothing's too hard. I am the shepherd, I am the door. I am the good news to the bound and the poor. I am, I am, I am, I am. 
I am the righteous one. I am the lamb. I am the ram in the bush of Abraham. I am the ultimate sacrifice for sin. I am your redeemer, the beginning and the end. I am. I am. I am. I am. I am Jehovah. I am the King. I am Messiah, David's offspring. I am your high priest. I am the Christ. I am your resurrection. I am your life. I am. I am. I am. I am. I am the bread. I am the wine. I am your future, so leave your past behind. I am the one in the midst of two or three. I am your tabernacle, I am your jubilee. I am, I am, I am, I am. I am hope, I am peace, I am joy, I am rest. I am your comfort and relief from your stress. I am strength, I am faith, I am love, I am power. I am your freedom this very hour. I am, I am, I am, I am. Thank you, Tita Sylvia. Thank you, Pastor Fred. May I please ask the ushers to please come and bring the offering? And shall we all please stand as we sing the doxology? Can you join me singing the Pastor Fred will be joining me in singing the doxology. Do you want me to pray for the offering? No. Let's sing the doxology first. Let's sing the doxology first. We're going to sing the doxology first. Are we? Okay, we'll sing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Loving Father, we thank you again for the privilege of assembling to worship, to uh, hear your word, and to share the goodness of the, your blessings to us, Lord, through these tithes and offerings. We thank you, Lord, for the, uh, the good jobs and income of our wonderful country and our wonderful community. 
And now, Lord, we thank you that as we share uh, these tithes and offerings here uh, before you this morning, Lord, that it would bring blessing to uh, the, the local uh, church and the region beyond where it's designated. Bless this offering in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Fred. And I think it's kids' praise and worship. And I'll be asking Stacy. Thank you. So, kids, come on up. Thank you again, Pastor Fred, Tita Sylvia. The mountain and come and see And just like Jonah you rescued me Mighty mighty is our God Mighty mighty is our God You are powerful and true You will always see me through Mighty mighty is our God Mighty mighty, mighty is our God Mighty mighty You make the sun rise Thank you, kids. Thank you, Stacy. And we'll be calling Pastor Blad to bring the gospel this morning. Good morning. Welcome, everybody. And it's always such an honor to listen to those cute, lovely children, this uh, great haired 51 year old guy with his message. But anyways, uh, coming back to the issue of uh, Pastor's Appreciation Month, I'll never forget one episode from my life when in 2011, way back in Ukraine, at the Grace Church in the city of Cherkasy, uh, after Pastor's ordination service, one of the ministers from our former church in Ukraine approached me saying, well, did you uh, consider it seriously, this call? Have you realized that deciding in your heart to become a pastor you have put your life on the altar of sacrifice for the service of the Lord, and there's no way back. I scratched my head saying, yeah, maybe I thought about it, but maybe not to such degree, not to such extent. Now I want to see your faces because I'm near sighted with optical crutches on. Melanie, is this you? Well, can you please stand up? Melanie, please stand up. This is Melanie Hunt from Little Woody Baptist Church, from our former church in Swan Valley, the Sunday school for our kids. And uh, is it your first time here? In the service. In the service. Okay, yes. Thank you very much. Welcome. See, with glasses, you can see far away. Anyways, before we go into the message, into God's Word, just a couple of uh, announcements, if not prayer requests. Our brother, Ken, the head of the Missions and Outreach Committee, Ken Platt, has been in the hospital between Nipawa and Brandon for three weeks. 
please keep him in your prayers. Some of you, I know you have already visited him in Nepal Hospital. Thank you so much for doing that. You pray for him, you prayed for him, and all your prayers, all visitation was so appreciated. But keep him in your prayers. I think tomorrow he'll be on the way to Winnipeg to do some more testing. So please pray for him. Another thing, I guess this coming Wednesday in many communities across Manitoba, there'll be uh, some elections. Elections to uh, vote for new town council members and uh, uh, public school division members and mayors and things like that. I think it's Wednesday. Uh, and if you're Canadians, born Canadians or new Canadians, I'm encouraging you to come and use your constitutional right to vote. Am I right, Brian? Use this right to to vote because if you do not vote do not grumble and complain that this person is wrong and the town council is a bunch of you know bad people use your constitutional right in a prayer so let's actually pray for that who would like still to pray for Ken Platt for God's mercy for God's healing for wisdom for the medical personnel to treat him to to find out how it can be fixed, his physical uh, illness. Just raise your hand. Who would like to pray for Ken Platt? Uh, yes, please, Miles. Good Father, just come to your throne, and Lord, we thank you that we can come to your throne uh, by your grace. And Lord, we just thank you for Ken Platt. Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you have given him, and we just thank you for the blessing that he is in this congregation and for the work that he has done here in the Lord, I pray that your hands would be in his life, Lord, that most of all you give him peace. And Lord, we just pray that you would comfort him and his family. And Lord, we do ask that you would please heal him. And Lord, if it is your will that there would be found out what's going on and that you'd be able to join us back here um, in church, honoring and glorifying you. Lord, we thank you that you are a caring God. Amen. Thank you so much. Who would like to pray for our community, for our town, for that Elections Day? Uh, just raise your hand. And uh, yes, this is our privilege to pray for our community. Does anybody want to pray for Wednesday? Just yes, please. For peace in Ukraine, God knows how, when, uh, for God's people in Ukraine, for Christ's church in Ukraine, I'm just asking you, friends, please raise your hand and pray for these specific requests. Does anybody want to pray for, pe for people of Ukraine, for God's church in Ukraine? Yes, please. So much. Now we can go to the text uh, of this message. God pronounces judgment and the first messianic prophecies, Genesis chapter 3, verses 9 through 11. Now I need God's help and your prayers to deliver God's word accurately. Father God, thank you so much for this Sunday morning you've given to us by your grace. Thank you for the freedom of worship that we can come to your house of prayer and worship you in the spirit and truth. Lord, I'm so thankful to you for every soul you have brought this morning to this sanctuary. 
Fill us up with your Holy Spirit, with clear understanding and faithful application of your word in our lives. And Lord, may the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth be pleasing in your sight, my Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. That's what we ask and pray for in Jesus' name. Amen. So we continue our journey, a short one, which can be a long one, through the first 11 chapters in the book of Genesis. And if you brought your Bibles to the church, will you please turn to Genesis chapter 3, verses 9 through 15. Genesis chapter 3, verses 9 through 15. Before we read those verses, let me start with some introduction to this text. Last Sunday, we studied the first eight verses in Genesis 3. It was the most tragic moment in the history of mankind when the first humans, Adam and Eve, fell into sin of disobedience to God and His commands. Having everything in place in paradise, living in a beautiful garden, they broke God's command. They showed disobedience to God, Creator. This morning, in verses 9 through 15, we're studying the consequences of the original fall of man. The Lord God pronounces the judgment for sin, and He also gives a hope of future redemption from the bondage of sin through the coming of the Messiah. So point number one of this message sounds like this. God pronounces judgment, verses 9 through 14, from Genesis chapter 3. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you not eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than any cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on her head, and you shall on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. First of all, I would like to focus your attention, dear friends, on God seeking and speaking to Adam and Eve, fallen sinners. Remember how they responded to God's question. It's from last Sunday when God initiated His search for His first created human beings. He asked them this question, where are you? It's not that just God did not know their location. He's almighty. He's all-knowing. But He wanted them to be accountable. He wanted to them to be accountable. And last Sunday we also talked about God's punishment on that serpent, on that snake, on that devil. Symbolically, God punished the devil, the fallen angel Lucifer, for tempting the first humans into that sin. That was last Sunday. And also, we talked about the first proclamation of the gospel in verse 15. So, Adam and Eve should have been running to God, confessing their sin, and asking for forgiveness. But instead, they were hiding from God, and the Creator had to find them. You know how sin works in our lives. We were kids. We, have, we had parents. And whenever we committed something wrong in the house, in our room, in our bedroom, playroom, in the kitchen, whatever, mom and dad often just called us on the carpet asking, well, son, what, what did you do? Why did you do it? And know how it works with kids, if you have children and grandchildren. Well, it's my younger brother, or it's my oldest sister, or it's somebody else. It's not my fault. It just fell on my head. I, did, I never touched that thing. Similar, exactly the same thing happened to Adam and Eve. They were hiding from God. 
They will hide it from God. And so our Lord often asks us questions for our good, to give us an opportunity to face facts and confess our sins. Now, now we need to talk about God's consequences, God's punishment for the first humans, for Adam and Eve and us as their human descendants in our text in verses, uh, in verses 16 uh, and verses 16, uh, verses 16 and 17, we can read uh, God's pronouncements of judgment. So, in verses, uh, if we just go back a little bit, 10 through 13, Adam and Eve, response to God was a blame game was a blame game, verses 10 through 13. Whom did uh, Adam blame for committing the open rebellion, the open act of rebellion? Whom did he blame? He blamed Eve, but eventually whom did he blame? God. You, God creator, you give this woman to be my wife, you are to blame, you are guilty, and she is guilty. She is to blame, but not me. I'm Adam. She just uh, gave me, passed on this fruit, and I, and I ate it. That's not my fault. So in verse 10 of our text in this chapter, we can see, clearly see that Adam was ashamed and afraid to be in the presence of Holy God Creator. Afraid and ashamed. And he started this blame game, this blame shifting game. The first result of sin was a sense of shame and fear. That's what usually happens to us people. When we commit a sin, we must feel some shame and some fear of being accountable before Holy God. But some of you, maybe many of you will have this question. Well, well, even in the days when people are not ashamed and they're not afraid of committing their sins and whatever. They love living in sin and they promote their sinful lifestyle to others. They want others to join and celebrate sin instead of being ashamed and afraid of their sinfulness. The aprons, remember what they did, Adam and Eve, to cover their nakedness. It was a there was a self-made human effort. So the aprons of those fig leaves speak of man's attempt to save himself by bloodless religion of good works. That was their self-made effort. It did not work. Now we're moving to God's consequences for their committed act of sin. Verse 16. I just am um, looking around, we have quite a few ladies in our midst this morning, quite a few girls. This is the word from God, creator, to the first woman, Eve, and to all ladies, to all women and girl, girls in the following generations. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. How do you like it? Just at first glance, this kind of judgment, this kind of uh, uh, punishment for Eve's uh, sin. I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children. Let me ask you a simple question, dear ladies, those who experienced motherhood, who've been mothers, who are mothers, was it easy for you to be in labor, to deliver your baby girl or baby girl? Was it just an easy stroll or easy walk? Was it? Tell us. No, it was hard. Out of five kids, by God's grace, I witnessed the coming into this world, three of those kids, particularly two younger ones in the, in the hospital in Dauphin. And I was, sometimes it seemed to me that I was passing out. You know, there were some episodes, and I think Laura, if she noticed that ever, I was like, oh. I mean, I'll never stay in the same bedroom with my wife. I almost committed myself. I sleep somewhere in the kitchen because there's lots of pain. There's lots of pain. 
And it's interesting, if you remember Genesis chapter 1, the first commandment from God to Adam and Eve was, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, including Manitoba, and fill Manitoba. But here, after the original fall, after original sin, God is pronouncing this judgment. I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. How about this phrase, my dear friends? This is an interesting one. The second half of verse 16. Yet your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. How do you like this statement from God? And he will rule over you. Any comments, any notes, any insights, how we can practically apply this uh, statement from God? What does it mean that woman's desire, wife's desire will be for her husband and he will rule over you? How do you like it? It's kind of... A very, a very complicated statement. Well, there are basically three schools of interpretation of this part of verse 16. I'm not giving you all three. I don't want to overwhelm you. But I'm giving you the most common interpretation of this part of verse 16. Yet your desire will be for your husband. After the fall, after the original sin, when the relationship between first humans and God was broken, the relationship between husband and wife was broken, their roles, there they, was a different turnout after the fall, and God is telling Eve that you and other women after you, they would be having this desire to be the heads in the home not letting their husbands to exercise that authority, but taking that authority upon themselves. You know how it works when you ask this question, who is the head in your family? Uh, many women would say, my husband, but who is the neck? Whenever neck turns, the same way the head goes. You cannot just turn your head without your neck. So you cannot exist as a head of the home. So this is the most common interpretation that there'll be a struggle, a fight for the headship of the home between husbands and wives and it started since the original fall when God pronounced this judgment. Verse 17. It's an interesting one. God's uh, judgment uh, to Adam, to him, for what he did. And let me remind you one thing. It's a very important one. Eve was tempted, right? She was deceived. She was deceived. But how about Adam? He sinned with wide open eyes. He knew God's command not to eat from that tree. His wife had committed a sin, and Adam, yeah, my wife has given me this fruit. She's my wife. I need to listen to my wife. And he took it, and he ate it. And now God's judgment upon man. And we have some men, quite a few men and quite a few boys today in our midst. Just listen. Then to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you, and in toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now, men, how do you like it? Do you like working in the sweat of your brow? I know many of you say, I do like to work. I sweat and I work, I sweat and I work. The work still can be enjoy enjoyable. The work is a gift from God. As long as we can, we like working, right? We like using our hands and feet and brain and eyes and, and just you name it. But this is a punishment, this is a consequence for Adam's sin. 
because you have listened to the voice of your wife. I'm not telling you today to stop listening to your wives because God often speaks to us through our spouses. He does. But this is a particular situation. That's where Adam did not have to listen to his wife. You listen to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree from which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat. Cursed is the ground because of you. And those of you who farmed or planted seeds into the garden, you know how it looks like, you know how it works. You just put your seed in the ground, and guess what? The thorns and thistles and the weeds, they just come up, and they come up all the time. You weed, yes, and they just come up. Thank you. Yes, and they just keep coming up because uh, it's uh, the way God punished uh, people for their sin. Now, speaking of Adam, God's judgment for the first, uh, the first uh, man. We know the facts. We know that the curse, uh, the curse is visible, is around us. But now let's go back to the most important part of this story. Verse 15, the first proclamation of the gospel, the Proto-Evangelium, verse 15. After the fall, it was bad, it was tragic. But now, right away, God is telling something. This insertion in verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. This verse 15 is one of the most extraordinary verses in the Bible. This means that the first time the gospel is preached in the Bible, the first time. It is the first time God promises the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who would come as the seed, who would be bruised, crucified, but who would bruise or crush, in other English translations, Satan's head. As God judged the serpent, as we have read last Sunday, the woman, the man, at the same time God promised a savior to the human family. This verse 15 also tells us there will be ongoing spiritual war between good and evil, between God's word and man's word. It's a spiritual war. It's around us. It's in us. It's at the thoughts level. It's a war between those who are godly and ungodly. It's a war between the devil and his demons against the family of Adam, us humans. It is a war that is ongoing until Jesus Christ returns. However, there's an interesting verse in Romans 16, 20, which says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The woman's seed would crush the devil's head, a mortal wound spelling complete defeat. Complete defeat. This is what most Christians believe is a direct reference to Jesus' victory on the cross in defeating the devil and paying the penalty for sin and the judgment of death. And the judgment of death. However, the final and ultimate destruction of the devil is still coming in future. And Revelation 20, 10, there's a verse that the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophets are also. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. The seed of the woman is a reference to the virgin birth because women do not have seed, right? Men do. As Christians, we all know as a fact that when Christ suffered on the cross, he died on the cross, but he rose from the dead, victorious over sin, hell, and the devil. So this Genesis 3.15 is a wonderful verse that sums up the spiritual war raging around us and God's provision of salvation in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ. So is there the way out for us human beings? in this spiritual warfare? Is there a way of salvation? Yes, there is. What is it? It is the salvation by faith 
through Jesus Christ for what he had accomplished on that cross in Calvary. And as we read or just studied a little bit this verse uh, 15, now I'm just uh, turning your attention to verse 20. The man called his wife's name Eve, Hava in the original Hebrew language, because she was the mother of all the living. And the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. So God's solution was to sacrifice an animal prophetically providing clothing for Adam and Eve. So the Lord slaughtered apparently some kind of animal and took skin off and just gave it as clothing for Adam and Eve to cover their nakedness. And that's a prophetic reference to the coming of Messiah, of Jesus Christ. Someday he would come and he came. And this prophecy turned to be true. Turned to be true. So as conclusion and application to this uh, passage, I just would like to make uh, some, uh, some statements. Not too many. Number one. God tests us to bring out the best in us, but Satan tempts us to bring out the worst in us. Two, we can overcome the tempter by having faith in Christ and putting all the armor God provides for us to fight the spiritual battle in Ephesus chapter 6 and by depending on the power of the Holy Spirit. And three, God the Father sought the lost sinners. Remember when we read in James chapter, uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 9, Adam, where are you? As God the Son, Jesus, did when he was on earth. Luke 19, 10. What does it say? Luke 19, 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save which was lost. And as the Holy Spirit does today, through his people, the church, in the book of Acts, and nowadays, God wants to use us to call men and women to salvation. Acts 1.8. Do you know the verse which is quite often commonly used at any outreach, at any crusade? Can you please turn to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse uh, 2? 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 2. I hope you remember what it says. 2 Peter Chapter 3, verse 9, which says, Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is now slow, is not slow about his promise. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Whenever we look around, whenever we look into our own hearts and minds, ask yourself this question, and give glory to God for His patience, for His patience. We have lots of questions about the bloodshed, the violence in this world, injustice, and just you name them. Why is there so much violence, injustice, and bloodshed? The answer is right here. Because the Lord is patient. The Lord gives opportunities, time, for other people to come to Him in repentance and faith. That's the only reason the Lord Jesus has not returned yet. Because He wants all people to come to repentance. Now the question, will all people be saved? No. Because remember Jesus' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. There's a narrow road and the broad road. Narrow gate and wide gate. Not all people will be saved. And whenever we think about it, we have family members, relatives, friends, neighbors, staff members who are not saved yet. It's hard. To imagine this picture that someday eternity will come to all of us, heaven or hell. 2 Peter 3, 9. Let's go back to chapter 3 and we'll close in a prayer. To our chapter 3. Verse 20. 
When Adam called Eve the mother of all the living, God has given us here hope that through the seed of woman, someday the Messiah would come. The Messiah would come and he would defeat the devil on the cross and the devil would be defeated finally and thrown into the lake of fire and the Lord will recreate the heavens and the earth and eventually, ultimately, everything will be set up good for God's glory. But meanwhile, we have some work to do in this world. As we heard at the Sunday school class, in the Sunday school class today, go and pass the good news to other people. And what is the good news? That our sins can be forgiven and our relationship with God can be restored. Let's bow for a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day you created for our good. Thank you so much for this time of fellowship and worship that we can bow down before your majesty, your holiness, your greatness. And Lord, uh, we need you. We need your interference. We need your strength. We need your power. We need your wisdom. We need your everything in our lives. Lord, uh, Come and become a savior in the lives of so many people around us. Lord, you know how many times, maybe for years, we've been praying for the salvation of our loved ones. And as long as we're in this flesh, we do believe and we do hope that you are able, if you wish, to save them. Lord, please save those whom we love, whom we have been praying for. Come, Lord Jesus, and restore the broken order in this universe. Lord, come, Lord Jesus, and take your bride home to where she belongs. But meanwhile, Lord, uh, shape us, prepare us, equip us to be a faithful and joyful servants wherever we are. That's what we ask and pray for in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Blen. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. For a closing um, song this morning, we'll be singing, Lord, I left your name on high. And if you could stand and join us as we sing this song, Lord, I left your name on high.
from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. You came from heaven to earth to show the way, from the earth to the cross, my death to pray, from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. And you came from heaven. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My death to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. For benediction, just reading the verses from the book of Numbers, uh, Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 to 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. May God bless you and keep you this coming week. And uh, Miles and Georgia, is this your last time with us? Can be? Well, they don't know. Remember this dear young couple, so they may come next Sunday, they may, be, they may not come because they're moving for a while to another province, but we hope and we'll be praying for you to come back, okay? All right? So just greet them on the way out. God bless you. Greet one another, love one another, and pray for one another. We are dismissed. Thank you. Thank you so much.